those are the kinds of things we buy cool stuff, uh, we do missions to earn money, we take classes to get smarter, and so on. All right. So, um, well, the font got screwed up but in the transfer, but there we go. Um, the first, set, the first uh, time you play the game, uh, really you've got to learn about everything, right? So uh, you get to choose an avatar, um, you get your initial resources, and then we have a little animation to kind of make you familiar with the, the concept of popularity in this game. How do you become popular, and, and what, you know, what do you need to do? So we walk through a, a few simple steps. It's your first, you know, first day at school. Uh, you, know, you, you get assigned a mate that's going to, a, 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 a friend who's going to help you out, and uh, fortunately this is a very popular friend, so that's already going to help you. And she's uh, demonstrating that in the first, you know, in this animation, by uh, throwing a party. She says, hey good kids, you know, I'm throwing a party tonight, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah this is good, plus one, plus one, plus one. Her popularity goes up, but at the same time, mine goes up as well, because she's my friend. But again, be careful, because if someone, um, you know, does something stupid, or they crash their car, and you know they kill someone, whatever. They lose popularity. You know, you better make sure you drop that friend, because uh, because it's going to hurt you as well. All right. Uh, there's also a little tutorial that teaches you about the first decisions you need to make inside uh, the game. So you can buy stuff to, to gain popularity. If you buy a cool item, uh, you can take a class that's going to increase your skills. And then uh, you know, once you uh, complete a mission, that's really the main way to actually make money. And the more skill you have, the more money you're going to get paid in your uh, in your missions. The typical turn is like you know really managing your friends. You come in, uh, you, you look at all the friends you have. If someone's done stupid stuff or their popularity is going down, you want to kick them out. Um, you know you you want to see like do I have enough friends and so on. Maybe I need to manage that. Then next, uh, you know you you go do stuff to raise your own popularity. So uh, maybe you buy something cool, or you do a cool mission that you know you become the hero of the school, and so on. And then, of course, you need to watch all your money. That's uh, you know a very important aspect of well, as well of this game. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that next uh, in one of the screens. And I'll sh only show you one or two, then I'm sure I'm out of time. Um, you know, this is the, the 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 money part of the game where you can manage your money, you can uh, take a loan, uh, you can transfer money between your accounts, you can put money in saving. One minute um, left. And then, uh, obviously, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things you can do. You can also take insurance. You know, when you buy stuff, you'll be asked, do you want to take insurance on this item? Um, and then, you know, all kinds of disasters can happen. You'll, you'll, you'll get a text message or a, um, a notification that, you know, something bad has happened. Maybe, um, you know, uh, whatever, a UFO came and, 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 and destroyed the school. Or maybe just, maybe someone stole your backpack. If you had insurance, you you probably can't read it, but uh, you know you can get your money back. So it teaches you good habits, uh, you know, through uh, you know all the money management inside the game, as well as uh, you know working with insurance and you know maybe disasters happen randomly, and, and, and uh, having insurance is a good thing. All right, that's it. It's our game. Okay, I'd like the many me team to come on up. Career, uh, either a solar farmer or an elvish mech warrior. It's a mashup of fantasy and sci-fi. Um, the jobs are randomly created, so there's a very wide possibility for random jobs, and funny sounding jobs too. Uh, clicker, clicker. It's not. Working. There we go. So uh, I'm going to do a little interactive. Uh, presentation of the first walkthrough of the game. 
you get your list of randomly generated jobs. Uh, you can click refresh if you don't like them, you can get more. You start off, you, it's a turn-based game, so at the beginning of the game is kind of like Monopoly. You get a random, random chance for a random event. It could be good or bad. And you get that. Your avatar comes back from work, he's not happy. Uh, you have to manage three skills. You have happiness, you have trust, and you have skill. Uh, trust is essentially <coughs> credit worthiness, how good you are at paying your debts and not going into the red. Skill is uh, your education, basically, your training, your ability to get a better job. And happiness <coughs> is happiness. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, right now, he's not very happy, so his apartment's a mess. He comes in, you have to clean up the apartment, make him a little bit happier. And he, okay, he's happy now, he gets plus one happiness. And the store, you get to manage, okay, you get to buy certain things to invest into happiness, invest into skill, invest into, uh, and there's different kinds of purchases. Uh, so it, the more money you spend, the higher your trust, because you're being responsible of paying back, or, or paying, what you have, you know, you're not paying more than you have. Uh, so certain purchases, like for example, you can get training as a space cowboy, that increases your skill, your ability to get a better job. Uh, other purchases are over time, so like a pet dragon, you can you pay fifty dollars per turn for the next four turns. So it's a long-term investment that you have to consider. Um, on the other side, you have the bank. You can store money. Uh, if you store money for every ten dollars you put in, you get one dollar out for the next two, for every two turns. If you borrow money, uh, oh, uh, quickly on the savings. If you want to get money out of your savings, it, there's a one-turn delay, so you can't get it out immediately the moment you need it because it's a savings account. Uh, borrow money works similarly to loans. You can borrow and you have to pay back for the next couple of turns with interest uh, if you're really in the red. And then there's the last one, which is in case, which is uh, basically insurance. Uh, for every one dollar you put into it, you can deduct uh, ten dollars off of a negative random event that happens. Uh, so you can get a lot of insurance or as little as you want. Uh, so here you go back at the bottom. You see the Facebook Live feed because you're connected to your friends. You see that Paula lost her job, and you already gave her a job. She lost another one, uh, but you can't constantly keep be giving her jobs, so you, you can only give one job away every day. And you're encouraged to do this because when you give a, a job, you get the job giver title at the top, so you get to brag about it, you're being a nice person. And you get a bonus, so you get plus one happiness for the next 20 minutes. And uh, so you get other things like, for example, your friend also, he bought a spaceship, you get to comment on it, there's a bit of a community on it. So everybody, like, if you see your friends buying a lot, it'll, like, you can comment on it, like, dude, you're spending all my money. One minute left. So the win condition is if you make it to retirement age, which is 60 turns. Uh, the, the longest the game can take is if you, make it, if you make it the whole way through is about half an hour. But if it, it's a turn-based game, so you can stop and go whenever you want. Uh, lose condition is if your trust score, your reliability, is zero or less for, the, for more than five turns. That means you screwed up pretty bad. And then regardless of the outcome, at the end, the next person you, the next character you play, half a minute you, left. You start off as a family tree. So your next character is the next in line in the family. Uh, yeah, that's uh, oh, there's the, the game loop is basically a start phase, time passes, uh, avatar returns to work, made, uh, yeah, random event for, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, I went through it on this game. <laughs> Okay, Pokeray Gumball Factory, you're the next team up. Please come on up. She's setting that up, I'll steal 30 seconds to just introduce myself. I'm Randy Angle. I run a uh, senior partner on Lunas Lab in Cotton Balls Open Business and we've been in the industry for 30 years. Thank you.
Um, I'm not going to actually talk to the speaker, but we need some speakers on the, the laptop. We will get some speakers on the laptop. Is there on? Uh, can't hear anything. Can you guys hear that? Well, there's a slight music of your volume on the computer. There we go. All right. Something special for our judges. The gumball factory makes gumballs and earns pennies when it sells them to customers passing by. Living in the gumball factory are the gummies, micro-sized beans whose job it is to make the gumballs in the factory. Gummies are hard working, but they also require the players constant attention to keep doing their work or even remembering their bodily functions. Fortunately, gummies are great at telling you when they need something. Managing the gummies really isn't too difficult. Tapping the tools bubble will cost some pennies and generate a chickle cob. Tapping the chickle cob bubble will make one gumball. Tapping the higher button will cost some pennies and add a new gummy to the workforce. Oh, those bodily functions. When a gummy gets hungry, tap it to feed it one gumbo. Later, it will need to poop. Tap the poop bubble to flush it away. Bad things happen if you don't constantly monitor your gummy workers. If you don't tap the tools bubble, they will get hungry. If you don't tap the parts bubble, they will get hungry. If you don't tap the hungry button, they will die. If you don't tap the poop bubble, they will die horribly. <laughs> when a gummy dies, you need to bury it. You can't hire a new gummy until you do. The Gumball Factory is a funny cartoon setting. The gummies are silly and sometimes do wacky things. The colors of the gummies are bright and exciting, like a 1980s Smurf cartoon. They have googly eyes and wear funny hats. The backgrounds and sets are more painterly and intricate. They depict the magical world inside the gumball machine and have a clockwork or steampunk aesthetic. Gears whiz, lights flash, flames flicker, and the steam bellows from the overworked pressure valves. Taps and interactions all have crazy cartoon feedback. Blurts, points, zaps, sizzles accompany all the interactions the player has with the world of Gumball Factory. Five minutes is a whole gummy day. Each round or day starts with today's prices and an objective. The prices change every day. The challenges get harder and the prices change the more you complete successful rounds. After the objective is shown, the gumball factory will suffer the whims of fate at the hands of the Wheel of Doom. To guard against disaster, the player may purchase insurance to reduce the risk. The pickle finger of fate will unleash such maladies as gumball rot, gummy plague, bankster crisis, inflation, hunger strike, Congress passed a bill. <laughs> what? Butterflies, kittens, and fluffy clouds. Gummies have a weird idea of what doom means. <clears throat> After the objective and the challenge conditions from the wheel of doom, the taptastic gameplay begins. You have five minutes of scrolling around the factory, maintaining gummies while counting gumballs made and pennies earned. At the end of the round, you receive a report card. Gumballs sold, pennies earned. Gumballs made, gummy deaths.
number of rounds played. If you reach your stated objective, you can add the unlocked item to your gumball factory decor. All right, thank you, Randy. I'll see what happens. Is the Mecca the educational nor games. Therefore, our guiding principle and our design in this contest are three. One, peer pressure is a very powerful thing. Two, teenagers do not want to be taught or talked down to. Three, they love robots and machines. My name is Ben. I work for Electronic Arts. Here's my partner, Ko. He teaches middle school in the San Francisco Unified School District. Allow us to present Mecca. First, the basics. It's an approachable 2D mobile robot owner simulator. That's a mouthful. Oh my god. That's okay. It's designed to have 20 to 25 minutes per session gameplay during the spare time only. That means outside of the classroom. And then teacher will, in the class, teacher will impart financial knowledge to the students by relating what happened in the gameplay to the, what, what, how each feature and mechanics relate to the real world. Let's talk a little bit about our world. Welcome to Metropolis. Metropolis is a science fictional world is, that's populated by mechons, which are the robots that you can control, and the necromancers, which are the player character that controls the mechon, and the champion of Metropolis, which is, who is the best necromancer that the player strives to be. The goal of the player is to be the champion of the metropolis. What do we mean by that? The measurement for success is to have the mechanism that makes most lifetime money earnings. And your competition will be your classmates, your fellow mechromancers. You will be ranked constantly, every second, every time you put up the, the, the game. So let's talk a little bit about our fun and our, our loop, also our fun loop. The core fun is owning and building your mechcom. The loop goes like this. You make money with your mechcom, performing a bunch of tasks. You can for either defending Metropolis or you perform construction projects for Metropolis. And, or you can enter pageant contests, whose robot is the most beautiful. And then you, you earn money, you then spend that money, to upgrade your mechon to make them better at performing tasks, therefore increasing their earning capabilities. Our analog schemes include Real Racing 3, which is where you race, make money, upgrade, and customize your car. Second game, Rage of Bahama. Very simple gameplay. One button, approachable, anybody can play it. You don't have to be familiar with hardcore gaming, you don't have to be familiar with smartphone at all. Key mechanics. One, dynamic, dynamic markets. What, that, what do we mean by that? If a job, if, if a lot of people are doing defense jobs, the payout is going to be lower. If a lot of people are buying cool parts, the price is going to be higher. Customizable mechanism. This that's straightforward. Third, a very obnoxious leaderboard that reminds you constantly you're behind Tanya, you're behind John. You, this is what you have to do to overtake the next person to become on your road to, to become the champion. Our first time player experience is here, but we can go into this later if you guys are so interested because I just cannot wait to show us, show you guys the prototype that we have. That's, that's on the iPad. 
so right here we have the first pull up screen. And the first time you pull up, you get you see you see a newsletter. It tells you what other kid what other kids has have done. So oh I see there's a this pageant contest this week. And then this uh, and then there uh, my friends made this outrageous money. I got I gotta beat them. So let's go and then let's do some quests and make some money. Like monsters. I like fighting. Let's let's do fighting. And then we're very simple, very simple gameplay. Just swipe. Swipe to do it, and then we win the money. And let's let's see let's see after that we do what we read. Now I see it's seven tiny it's like six. I need to make ten thousand more. I can't I can't possibly do surpass that by just doing that quite. So let's see what's the what's good on construction. Oh my God, they're making a lot. You can make a lot more money on construction. So let's see what I can do about it. I can go in, mm, let's see, I can make some trust so that I can get better at construction. So let's buy some trust. And uh, we can see here, we also, I have also been saving for a helmet that has been accumulating interest and putting money. Uh, but right now I just want to buy the legs. And now I have the trust for my back. And uh, I also know there's a pageant contest coming up. I might want to purify my bot a little bit. So let's see, um, red, candy coat, yes. Let's have the candy coat. Time's up, sorry. And yep. So what we like? Give us give us a chance. Give us a chance. Okay, next team. Um meet no. Gabriel Cornish. Come on up. Hey, sorry, they're, they're all setting up. Uh, uh, I'm Gabriel Cornish, uh, I'm an indie game developer. Um, this is actually my first game jam, so I hope you guys like what I have to bring to the table. To reach 14 to 17 year olds, uh, we can't bombard them with the complexities of financial literacy. We have to keep it simple. But how do we keep something as complex as financial literacy um, without sacrificing uh, the depth? How do we make a game that has infinite amount of depth, is constantly changing to the player's everyday life, and is simple enough that a five year old can pick it up and play? My game aims to ask one very simple question. If you had $500 to start a new life, how would you spend that money? What decisions would you make? Would you do things differently? Would you blow it all in one night with your friends? Or would you invest in your future? Entrepreneur is all about presenting the player with dynamic opportunities, the choices they make, and how those choices affect themselves and their social network. Entrepreneur is a game that takes the deep decision making of the Sims and blends it with the simplicity and fast-paced elements found in Candy Crush and Bejeweled. In the game, players are given $500 thanks to a generous family investor and are told to go spend it how they see fit. Every turn, the player is presented with a dynamic opportunity which they can scroll through and spend their money on. After making their choice, the player receives immediate feedback on how much their choice cost them what they profited from, and what it meant to their happiness. The goal is to live your life the way you see fit. No wrong choices, only consequences. Dynamic opportunities are what drives gameplay. These are custom-made scenarios pulled straight from the player's social network interests and presented to them in a way that is relevant and adds weight to the choices they make. Are you a 49er fan? 
Don't be surprised to see tickets show up as an opportunity. Choosing to buy these tickets might limit further future opportunities, but might also open some doors. Trading happiness for money or money for happiness are some of the tough decisions that players are going to have to make. Why, players, why will players be invested and continue to come back? World news, celebrity trends, and your friends' social lives all play a part in creating these opportunities, and they're relevant and fresh to the player. Anything that is happening right now in our world can be used to create an opportunity. It becomes fun. Endless amount of depth, diversity, a completely customized experience for the player, choices that get bigger as wealth accumulates. These are all features that are grounded with simple to understand mechanics. Choice in the outcomes. Your decisions don't only affect you. Comparing success and the choices your friends are making is a huge part of creating a micro-economy within your social network. Kathy might have the opportunity to start a business, which in turn creates a dynamic opportunity for you to invest in that business. Your buddy Bill might not have enough money to pay for his insurance, but you just got a nice return on your investment. Why not help him out? The biggest question is why would students want to play this game? It's the same reason that high school students are curious to see how, who in their class is most likely to succeed. You see, students are fascinated with the possibility of success, but more importantly, they're fascinated with how they can achieve that success. There's so much more to entrepreneur that I don't have time to go over, but as you can see, the simplicity of the gameplay can extend to a wider demographic than just 14 to 17 year olds. It applies to everybody. That's entrepreneurs, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. going to be our learning loop. In our game, players will make choices, lots and lots of them, and immediately see their feedback for their choices. And I want to highlight that because it's a little bit different in the problem I see with normal life, so to say. You might make a choice a couple weeks ago that affects you today, but you might not even notice it. It's two weeks ago. We live a very fast-paced life. With that, oops, I didn't mean to go forward, but it did. With that, we get to see our progress and get cool houses. So here's a choice. Our friends have invited us to an after-party show at a fashion event in New York City. Or we could go to the business conference our boss talked about. We have to balance our money, our popularity, and our confidence level. Confidence is what helps us close deals and take advantage of events. Popularity increases the chances of getting good events. 
So if we spend $50 and go to the party, we can gain popularity. But we're already pretty high on that right now. We have a dilemma though. Going to the business conference will increase our confidence, which is great for us right now, but we only have $200. If we put it on our credit card, that's going to come out of our income in the future. So what is the player going to do? There's no right and wrong answer, it's up to them, but they immediately get to start seeing their consequences. Next slide. Yeah, this, 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 yep. You can move over there. Oh my god, wait, sorry. You bring it back. Just stop. Just keep that All right, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, making decisions, all this stuff, but what is the motivation? Why, why do this teenager want to succeed? So we wanna, this game is called Pixel House and it's obviously about building a Kika's awesome big house. And you're gonna start with a small one and eventually your financial decisions will bring you to a better job with bigger income. You're gonna have to pay loans for the house, but eventually you're gonna have a Kika's house. And obviously share on Facebook and show your friends how good you are. And it's not only that, uh, but you also can customize the house inside, which we all know is pretty appealing to everybody. And especially to the social component. So you're going to buy furniture, put it around. But let's focus on the first minute of gameplay. We just made like a quick uh, wireframe over here. So let's start. You start your pixel house. You will customize your character. So let's make some connection with the, with the player. You're going to be this guy, sex, hair, skin. Let's call this guy Morgan, for example. And then you're going to just start your game. You will see Morgan wandering around his parents' house, which is a good example of a house that you want to have later. And they're going to just have like a good convers uh, conversation. Hey, Morgan, congratulations, you just made it to the college. And college is something that, that teenagers want. Go to college that day when I get my independence. But independence doesn't come with a price. They kick you out of the house and you're going to have to buy the first house, which is going to be like the small one. And you're always, we see the great out once and you can always scroll up to see all the bigger house that you can have later. So that can show you the progression. We'll get Two or three, make a choice, a start. So now your choice actually connects the player with the new house. And now you're going to be here with your roommate, a small intro. Hi, roommate, how are you? And then, oh, new event. There's going to be a party tonight. So, yeah, we're not the only one that start with a party. <laughs> so, but here you're going to make a choice. There's a party tonight. It's going to tell you, blah, 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 the party. And what you want to do tonight, study or go party? As we said before, uh, the study will give you com uh, confidence. Party will give you um popularity and let's say uh, what would you choose this time like let's start it first first time in the game do we have to study do we have to do party party okay <laughs> nice <laughs> i knew that that's why party so you will One get okay you will get the instant feedback what what well i think it's clear yeah. see the party see everybody awesome so moving forward Go back one slide. Our character is going to give us speech bubbles. We can do lots of cool things with these speech bubbles. We can tie them to other players' Twitter accounts and we start seeing what they're saying. But also, he's going to give us some foreshadowing. If we pay attention to our character who's just running around, we don't control him directly, we buy stuff. But if we pay attention to his needs, we can help steer him towards the best decisions that are going to move him forward. On the left, we have okay. missions. On the left, we have our missions. So you can build up long term to kind of complete those. And those are what you upgrade you to your house. Next slide. And if you click on the card, it takes you to all the other parts of the game, including the store. You can get CDs to offset your loans. You can get insurance to prevent bad events because bad events will hit you. And if your savings are low, it's going to drop all of your scores. Next slide. We like lots of funny sayings for our character, one of which is, it's life just a game. Thank you. So what's birthday is it? Because I see birthday cake in the back. <laughs> That was a goal yesterday. Blakey! Blakey. Yay! Happy birthday! Happy birthday! So, a two minute bio and cake break while we shift on to the rest of the presentations. Do you do this for everybody's birthday? It's just as one of the. Oh, I want a fucking game. Jam a letter. Alright, okay.
but obviously as with any other bank account itself, uh, would be available on desktop or tablet. It's taking real rewards and combining those with real actions and making it this something that can totally redefine the student banking experience with a guided and traditional game. Half a minute left. Thanks. Yep, I think we covered it, so. to our first game. without getting financial literacy skills, which is quite a few folks. Okay, so if you saw this, the picture there, it would be right up there. Um, and it has my name, and I wish it said Smooth Games, but it didn't. So, oh, it says Indie Game Developer. It should have said Smooth Games if I knew I had a, a title. Okay, next slide. Oh, You're clicking. Uh, where do I point? Here? I don't know if the clicker is working. You have to, like, shake it a little bit. <laughs> No, you're just clipping. You've got to click this one. Oh, you got to click yeah. this one. Okay. So, I'm just going to run through this quickly. The game concept. You're growing, the player's growing a sailing business. That's the whole context. That's the metaphor, okay? This thing doesn't talk about financial literacy, financial planning, checkbooks, or anything. We're going to have a sailing business, okay? Think of it as a non-combat RPG, okay? You're going to level up by learning financial literacy, but you're not going to know that. Okay, you're going to gain skills. There's a simple leveling system, and as you go through the levels, you will not achieve the next level until you've uh, learned and demonstrated that you have certain skills that come in layers for financial literacy. Then we have open and quest play. What that means is that you can run around and explore and, and, and just find things in the zone or zones that you have access to. The first zone is called Lonely Island. The reason you're on Lonely Island is because you've just started, there's no other players there, that's your world, you're stuck there kind of like a kid at home. You want to get out there. What do you want? You want to be on a boat, okay? So, so that's what quest play does. Um, you, you, your first quest, you learn how to sail and you get your boat, okay? You level up at that point. Um, now how do you learn these things? There's a narrator at the very beginning of the game. Let's call him something like Commander Bill. And there's, you know, four or five little text bubbles that come up that kind of guide you through the context of the game and teach you some of the various skills. And then, you know, you run around and do a few things, and then the next bubble's up. By the end of it, Commander Bill gives you your first quest where you go out and sail, and then you get awarded your boat, and you're no longer a land lover. You're now a sailor. Level two. Let's call it sailor. It's an attractive, brightly colored, zone-based, island cartoon world. Use your imagination. It's massively cool. If I could just plop it right out of my mind into your mind, y'all would love it. <laughs> okay, so what are the basic game mechanics? Role-playing, like I mentioned. We have game modes. You're going to be on land. You're going to be at sea. You're going to have a map. On the map, you're going to have zones that you've already been in, that you have access to, where there's a lot of detail on there. There's also zones you have access to that Portions are browned out because you haven't been to that part yet. You can go there and discover things. Maybe find some quests. 
Then there's going to be other more outlying areas that are grayed out. You just know where they are. You don't. Know, you can't see anything about them. You'll find out later. But but it makes you think about what's going to happen next. You've also got a boat tree. It's like you get your first boat. I mean, it might be a rowboat. I don't know yet. It's a little old, tiny boat. But you'd like to know what are the other boats that you might get. So you have you have a boat tree that will tell you what kind of boats you might get. And then a dashboard. That's just all your key metrics and stuff like that. There's a, there's a heads up display at, at most times to give you the key stuff, but there's also a dashboard mode. You got movement, you got walking, you got running, you got sailing. Depending on how good you're sailing, you might be swimming. <laughs> okay, we won't let you drink. Left. How long? One minute. Okay. Resource management, risk and reward, randomizers, player input through context, sensitive gesture, mapping. This is your leveling of uh, financial uh, literacy. Land lover, it starts. Sailor, you got a boat. When you're a skipper, you've gained planning skills. When you're a navigator, you got choice modeling. Captain, tracking and assessing. Commander, pivoting budgets gonna rock. Think you've been in a big storm, one of your boats and your fleet sunk. Okay. What are you gonna do now? Okay, these are the victory conditions mechanics. Setting goals, loss avoidance, puzzle guessing, structure building, gaining experience, and finally level to commander. You have reached Commander Bill's level. These are some other games that are similar. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. So, Sol McGinn. And while you guys uh, come up, the center button is not what you use for clicking, that's for pointing. Uh, the left and the right is what you need to go forward or backward in your slots. I missed the very beginning. Do we know how many of these there are? 21. Thank you. Sorting is done, the scoring is done. So here's we've got the selection phase. Here we've got one guy who did a little, one round of play. He decided to go for a car, a trip to an amusement park. Money is third on his list, and I hate it when that happens. He wound up bankrupt. 38000 in the hole. His money was not enough for that one. So um, at that point, you can go to, let's see how everybody else is doing. You'll notice yellow, yellow is loans, so red is other people who have gone bankrupt and so forth. 
Green is the money is good. One person has two dollars, one person has one dollar, but it's their own money. They still have money. This one has four million, but let's face it, parents have money. There we go. Here are some alternate, alternate plans. Um, this person picked books, put money second, a big travel trip third. The extra bit of play as of using the extra bit with using money as a play item is anything following the money as far as your rank choices, anything after money is discarded. So push the play button and the result is person's got his books and still has money, comes up green. This person wants to go to school. Education, going to need a computer, going to need books. You'll notice in here money is not being used as a play item, but it's still in the background as the general pool of money. Select and. Person's going with a loan, but the person does still have money with that loan. The person can afford all of the items and keep going from there. Uh, basically, one round of play is sorting the three, selecting the three items, and then scoring. Um, you can just keep going in multiple rounds. If you're looking at a whole bunch of items that you want to do, say you, you know, you're, not, you're not looking at just three items, you want to do 15. Okay, that's going to be a lot of sorting, so you just keep working your way through and then play, see where you wind up. Initial target audience is 14 to 17, but with additional features to extend the basic game, actual ages can range from pre adolescent all the way to any age, any age adult. Examples of play items can be money, health, education, good health, books, car, house, movie, whatever. More than three items can be chosen. Um, a job can be a profit item. You put a job in, you're getting money out from it, so that can be an advantage there. Um, in the first stage of the game, there is a preset item and their costs. Additional items can be added by the player. Additional items can be added that other players have created. In advanced forms of the game, there's the, uh, there is the issue of how good is your information. You can say you have a million dollars, but how good is that information? Uh, reflecting this, additional items can be added that non-players have created and are selling, such as information from a totally reliable and current database of car costs, tuition costs, etc. With quality information, you get much better information. Um, you've got mom and dad, fifty thousand dollars, but then you flag that as a loan. That's going to one be, minute. That's going to come up as um, a basically a loan. Gameplay can be saved with a single person play or multi-person pooled resources. So you've got two people wondering how do we pool our money? What? How well do we do? Scale of time can be factored in, and you'll see how you do against others. Thank you for your time. Game of Plans, next team. <coughs> Did you guys have a presentation, Game of Plans? to know that big business is legitimately trying to find a solution for uh, financial literacy. So um, thank you for the opportunity. First, um, getting started. I had to figure out first exactly what is it that Amtrust is asking. I know you want a game, you want it to be mobile, you want it to be for 14 to 17 year olds. But I had to ask, well, are you really asking for a game or are you asking for a way to get people to play the game of life a little bit better? I don't think you can out-game. You're not going to make a better game than a real-life game of life. With respect to the smart minds here. But I think, um, one, 
financial literacy is a, a financial literacy is a family duty. It's not something that you wait until they get to like 14 years old and start teaching them that in school. Like, you missed a big step, right? Um, the silly notion, I guess that's not on the road, is it? The silly notion that you can't do business with family is something that we need to get rid of. And once we get rid of that, then we start getting to the uh, core financial literacy. So the game that I put together takes into account two things. One, your family score and your clan score. Your family score, you earn that with a combination of things. Are you participating in the modern sharing economy? Um, is your family using modern money, Ripple, Bitcoin, Litecoin, whatever, to add to your family income? Um, your clan score is a collection of family scores, but we'll get to that in a second. So with your family score, if you do a number of things, um, does your family collect coupons? Well, that's savings. You're actually saving your, money, your family real money. That should go towards your family score. Does one person, can one person in your family just take a JavaScript class? Are there smart people in your family? If that's the case, that should improve your family score as well. Um, if you pay one of your real life bills, not any kind of virtual stuff, you pay one of your real life bills, come on, using either shared economy mechanics or profits you've made from modern money, that should influence your family score. I think big picture for the overall family score is we have a different scoring system that we can look at that tells creditors, tells landlords, whatever the case is. Number one, what methods are you using to make sure that you pay your bills? And secondly, who has your back? I can look at any credit score right now, I can't tell any of those two informations, and that's just asinine. You can't have a credit scoring system that doesn't take income into consideration. That's stupid. So that's how you build up your family score. Now, clans, um, imagine a scenario where I work for a car repair shop. And every time I need to order a new part, I call up my buddy John and place the order. Well, we've been doing business for a while. And clearly, we do business well together. So let's find out what else do we do business in? Or what else can we do business in? And that's what the clan is. So I invite John to bring his family into my clan. And let's get our families doing business together and that improves your, family, your clan score. If a clan takes on a family that has a, a terrible score and within months they build up that family score, that helps improve the overall clan score as well. So you're creating that village behavioral um, instincts of we take care of each other, I have your back, you have mine, and the financial decisions your home what makes impacts the financial decisions of my home as well. So once you start putting these two scores into the mix, I think we create a completely dynamic um, financial literacy behavior. We start getting kids participating in the family business long before they get to a teacher who's likely in debt herself or himself, and we're asking that very same teacher who's likely in debt to teach our kids about financial literacy. That's from the beginning. <laughs> Half a minute left. All right. Uh, so that's what the Game of Clans is. and. Uh, Thanks again for the opportunity. The only problem is your financial advisors and a host of other non-player characters are focused on keeping you wealthy. The good news is you have a bunch of goodwill guardians, so your personal growth and development builds your self-awareness. So each event creates a random scenario each turn. The outcome of that scenario creates an opportunity to increase the player's self-awareness, and it's shown on the SAM, self-awareness meter. How cute is that? And changes your character's appearance. So to win or lose, the player must learn from the decision to balance the meter. As the meter goes down, the avatar becomes poor and thin until it evaporates. As the meter goes up, they get like me, fat and full of money until they explode. <laughs> Excellent, okay. So uh, I'll just run you guys through a quick example of the game flow. Um, so basically we have uh, the objective screen, uh, different missions, turns, time limit, uh, requirements. And then uh, it would move into the game aspect, which would be in the next screen after that. And at the end of each mission, you'd know how much you uh, fulfilled in each mission so that the player kind of understands what they were doing, the balance. And it would be a simple level board if it was on a mobile screen, of course, just going from level one, level two, branching up to you get the most financial awareness possible. Uh, so, of course, uh, this would be the first title screen you come into the game, rich to achieving financial awareness. Next, you have the uh, events that the player gets to choose. 
these are just examples. You get to choose from global health, education, auto gambling, or donation charity as ways to uh, take care of the wealth and get it out there to the system. Now, from that, you have choices. So let's say they chose donation uh, charity, then they have a choice of how to get, use this uh, donation charity. They can give the 100 million to feed 4 million homeless, uh, 50 million to feed 2 million homeless through a third party organization, or 75 million to give to goods and services to local churches. So it gives a bit more variety. And then from that, you get uh, a variable that would be the result of the decision made. Maybe it gives them money for whatever reason, maybe it doesn't, maybe it causes a downfall in the market. It would be a cool way to implement something that really causes them to think more about each decision made. And then from that, this is the part I really enjoyed, was making this awareness meter. So instead of just focusing purely on the game, the player also has an in-game avatar, and every decision will result in their character changing based on what was Kevin saying, to getting to losing money and getting thinner and weaker and evaporating, which you would fail, or to gain more money and then you would get a pool of money and explode eventually because you have so much wealth. And both would be bad, essentially, so you kind of want to achieve balance throughout the entire game. So I'm hoping that from this, the players develop really good habits and get more financially aware. And at the bottom, of course, is the uh, financial meter showing at each uh, level. So this is the killer deal. After they've learned something and they become self-aware in the game, you got to transfer it in the real world or we haven't accomplished our goal. Critical building player habits and extending the player's self-awareness to others is to reward play. Each time a player maintains a wealth balance, in other words, the self-awareness meter is ideal, bitcoins are earned. So they can use this in the real world to expand their learning curve. Recruiting new players earns the player bitcoins. Each time they return the game, they receive bitcoins. A reduction of bitcoins occurs each day a player does not play, and they evaporate entirely in 45 days. To generate players in the target audience of 14 to 17 year old high school students, the game developers will donate 20% of the monthly bitcoins back to the school's booster organizations. So these booster organizations are filled with parents. Now you've extended the game to the parents and all the rest of the community. So you've got traction, you've got loyalty, and you've got an education that's beyond just the people that are playing the game every day. This traction extends rich death to a larger audience and generates self-awareness while promoting will. Thank you. Teenager. Here we can see the feedback of the floor generating an income of plus three currency. 
everything seems good at first. An influx of funds, the ability to start construction, but wait a minute, something is happening. The loan begins to automatically be siphoned from the player's income. They can immediately see the impact this has on their profits by observing both the change in color of the flag and the additional red minus one currency. Notice also that the plus two is shrank. The size of the graphic provides more feedback that the player is now receiving less money. If the player decides to continue down the path of taking loans and building more floors to pay off debt with more debt, additional feedback shows the player that they are now losing over half of their income to their loans. Finally, when the player reaches their maximum debt, they will no longer receive any income until the debt is paid off. A player may also mortgage floors during this time, much like in the game of Monopoly. The mortgage can help players pay off financial debt, but it has the offset of the floor not producing any commodities. So let's pretend, well first, here's an example of Sorry. Here's an example of someone successfully balancing the budget, of, uh, taking a small loan against their high currency. Notice the child is still surprised, but this time it's by how much money he has. So let's say that someone has been responsible. Excuse me for a second. After each, okay, I'm just skip here. After each cycle in the game, players are presented with a financial report. This is a quick summation of their net earnings and expenses with an obvious green for net gains or red for net losses. The green red theme is prevalent throughout the game in most forms of feedback. So let's play the player is doing well, they've built up nine floors, what's next? Every tenth floor of the game is a super floor. Super floors generate more revenue and commodities, but they also open up more learning opportunities for the player. When a player builds their 10th floor, they are able to create or join a community. Communities have tons of advantages. The Mega Scraper Community Construction Project, Observation of Other Players, and Leaderboards. The community-built Mega Scraper is constructed cooperatively by all the community members. All revenue and commodities produced by the Mega Scraper trickle down into the community. The Mega Scraper is positioned on a regional leaderboard compared against the community's other communities' Mega Scrapers. This allows for competitive team effort to exist in multiple small groups, perfect for a classroom setting. Players are rewarded with revenue for visiting other players in their community. At a quick glance, a player can judge another player's success based on the number of super floors his tower has. Additionally, players can view each other's last earnings report to help parse their financial strategy. One minute left. One last thing players can do is make investments. I'm just going to skip over this. So why would players come back to the game? Firstly, the game's core loop is fun. You get to build an awesome tower and collect money. Second, the game is played socially. The community mega tower will get friends inviting each other back to play. The game should have tons of metrics, recording how far players progress, how much time players spend playing the game, etc. But the most interesting metric, metric would be this. How many players started the game by taking out loans, then pivoted when they discovered that this wasn't the best financial strategy? In summation, Super Scrapers is a fun, engaging game that teaches young adults financial literacy by making them feel the actual impact debt has on one's income. This is directly applicable to real life. Once you give someone that knowledge, they can work out the percentages and the details themselves. That's the presentation on Super Scrapers. Run by credits. You guys are next. Thank you. Anyway, I got all mixed up there. I was like, this. Hi, my name is Andy Pickett. I am with uh, an indie game called Conquer on iOS and Windows Phone. It's a social game world domination. Check it out. Uh, I'm here to talk about run by credit. So. Kids today have no idea how to manage money, uh, let alone credit. I know I fell into the trap in college, you, you get the, the, the free t-shirt stands giving away t-shirts to sign for a credit card. Next thing I know, I graduate college with four credit cards and I have like 5% utilization level. Um, I'm not alone. And bad t-shirts. And bad t-shirts. Um, they, they pass a lot of laws now, you have to be 21 or over to get a credit card or you have to uh, have a co-signer. Um, but regardless, if you are not taught good credit concepts early on, you're still gonna fall into those traps. Um, admittedly, the game mechanics I'm going to describe don't matter so much as the hook that is uh, in the items that you buy in the game can be bought on credit and paid back over time and end up making monthly payments. Uh, so, kids like kids like Homer need to understand how how money works. Uh, money can be exchanged for goods and services. How do I get money? I get a job. So. The theme of my game is going to be just a lawn mowing service, just basic entrepreneurial service. Uh, a lot of lawn mowing games have been done on mobile platforms. A lot of them are um, tile-based or, or square grids. 
I'm going to turn it into a runner. So we're going to play either, it's either going to be two-dimensional or uh, a three-dimensional game like Temple Run. So I'm basically, I'd be totally fine with cloning Temple Run's mechanics as far as the lawyer, lawyers will let us. Yeah. And the, the, the key note, the reason I settled on that is that uh, the runners do great in both male and female demographics and around the world. It's, it's, a, it's a universal, easy to grasp concept um, and simple mechanics. So if you've never played Temple Run before, it's an over-the-shoulder 3D runner. Your character is on tracks. You just literally swipe the phone to turn as, you, as uh, angles show up, or you swipe up to jump or down to slide. Uh, we're going to make it a lawn mowing game, so it's going to be on tracks, and it's going to be green grass. You're going to turn left and right, jump over stumps, slide under jumping dogs or whatever. So a little bit disconnected from reality. Uh, but the point is, as you're running, you'll collect coins. Uh, quarters, dimes, nickels probably use real-world currency just to make it make it click a little bit more. Uh, but then, so so the game itself, really fast, 30, 60 second sections, but you get a lot of them in. Um, all these all these traditional RPG games, runner games, they all basically have a store where you get the upgrades and your power ups. Everybody's familiar with this, uh, but you have to have the cash in hand in order to buy the items. Um, so I would literally steal all the things: magnets, speed boosts. Um, triple the values of the coins, things to make your every run more valuable, so you're, you're trading your time for money. Um, but I want to price them so that your first initial sessions, you might, your kid might collect 20 bucks worth of stuff, but his, his lawnmower upgrade might cost 500 bucks. How is he going to get that? He's going to have to sign up for a virtual credit card, maybe you know, fake credit card names or something like that. We'll, we'll have it uh, less boring than this form, but then uh, he'll go to the store and he'll buy from some crazy character that uh, lists out all the items and stuff like this. So there might be three or four different lawnmowers here, and the, the, the really great one he can afford, he'll get a credit limit of like 2000 but the monthly payments for that might be 200 bucks or something a month. Um, and so I kind of want kids to fall into the trap of getting the shiny thing and then going broke and then having to not make their payment. Um, that's a very dangerous thing in, in traditional game design because now you're going to you're going to take my cheese, and I'm very nervous about taking away from the player, but that's the kind of lesson we want to teach. Um, so, so the kids in the game will buy stuff on credit, and then um, the, the implication is there will be a time component, because we want them to pay their bills um, on a monthly schedule. So every four runs might take a week. You can do 16 runs in a, in a game month, and by the end of the month, you have to pay your bills. Not sexy. This is not fun, but we have to, have to find some way to make it. The UX enjoyable for the kids, um, so that they can understand how what a credit card statement looks like. Because I never saw one before. I had my predatory lending uh, credit cards. <laughs> uh, can't make a payment. A real world FICO score in a game tracking tracking your credit score. I want this to model the real world um, Fair Isaac credit credit rating stuff as much as possible. With like links to like browser links out to read more, and learn more about it, but uh, try to maintain uh, as much. I know it's boring, but as much reality as possible. Uh, miss enough payments, repo men come in, take away your lawnmower. Um, I want to use uh, tools like Mint.com and stuff like that to provide. I think their UX is great. This has helped me personally a lot, like understand my financial situation and, and being able to understand Stop the trade off. Tracking network over time, I think. I think, I think, I think, oh. I think uh, and also, um, myfico.com has an excellent site to understand FICO scores. <laughs> Um, I'd like to have the game mechanics model fight the stores as much as possible, but it's difficult because of the, the time to go on. We have to make the gameplay stuff compelling. You know, I'm going to be mowing lawns for, for 60 years of virtual gameplay uh, to have your length of credit history go up, so we have to manage that. Uh, there's a lot of risk. I think, I think the game, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to add more things like inflation, savings account, investment. I don't want to lay in too many mechanics, but let's see. So Radio City Music Brawl, you are a young hotshot with $300 in a dream. Music industry success. Radio City Music Brawl is a simulation game challenging the player to manage a band 
and music groups rise from garage band status to world famous rock stars. On the path to stardom, the players confronted with key management decisions based upon real world situations that music groups face today, and given a set of options to choose from. It's from these key decisions that financial literacy lessons will be seamlessly integrated into the gameplay. The goal is music industry success. With each correct decision, the player is rewarded with money, cred, performance skill, bad choices will punish you with losses. Amassing more money and cred will, uh, amassing more, uh, sorry, amassing more money and cred and performance skill allows the player to progress towards stardom, while a leaderboard can provide a measurement of comparative success against other players and friends. High-level bands can also be bought and sold on the open market to other players willing to invest their money in future growth and success of new bands. In addition to core simulation gameplay, mini games will be embedded in the game to allow players to directly complete, compete with uh, others via the music brawl mode. Players can track themselves and others through Facebook. Their friends will be easily listed on the right column. Available opponents will be listed on the left column. Once the challenge has been initiated, the game will move to the battle screen where everything will be auto-resolved, much like a game like Ninja Wars. I don't know if you guys have seen that game. Uh, the winner receives a ticket revenue bump from the big show. The loser also receives a sliver of revenue. So the game is both competitive and cooperative picking, because picking on your friends also gets them leveled passively. Uh, but the active player will have to suffer a cooldown penalty. So you have to weigh out the risk of will I, you know, will I sacrifice the time lost when my team, when my band cools out versus the, you know, the potential of the gain of the money. So it's a, it's a very key decision you have to make right there. Well, after that, uh, it will go, the game will move into a bird's eye view in the general map, and the, the players will navigate to find available opportunities and performance venues. After selecting a given venue for your band to perform, a player is taken through the decision prompts in a form of talk with your assistant. This, the decisions presented to you will directly reflect the next show. Alongside every decision will be an Ask Your Assistant button, with, which will outline the pros and cons of the choices. This is our teaching moment for financial uh, literacy. Smart choices will lead to success, poor decisions, and you might find your artist flunking back down into the boondock venues and the, the house party scenes. Our target audience is 14 to 24. We are attracting this age group by using familiar concepts of parties, concerts, music, and advise them on important money management lessons that are integrated into the core of the game. The age group has naturally shown a strong affinity for the concepts of the music industry and its accompanying lifestyle. Symbols of wealth, celebrity cameos, familiar and famous music industry faces appear and will cross over between TV and the game. We, feel, we felt that this would be a natural hook to attract the initial attention of teenagers. Decisions are still going to be at the core of this game. You are the music manager in charge of guiding musicians to the top of the charts. Your assistant will present you with key decisions to make and will often have important advice to guide you towards success. She will praise you and berate you accordingly. The manager's assistant is the natural delivery method we will always choose for these financially, financial literacy lessons. The final hook to keep people grinding will, will be music download, concert ticket rewards, and even ultimate level prize support that will be awarded to only a few super level players. Paid music, paid music in industry summer internship opportunities, celebrity meeting opportunities, and college scholarships will be awarded to selected eligible students every year. You are a young hotshot with $300 in a dream, music industry success. Yes, you can get there through solo play alone, but the game really starts to get interesting with, when you start to get to the level unlock features, like uh, more assistance, better gear, more gameplay modes. There's a cooperative and competitive element of, cha of challenging all the other players through music brawl mode and in the game through the band exchange. Here, I want to run you through a quick uh, start of the game before I run out of time. <coughs> Radio City Music Brawl. So we got the, this is the load screen splash, boom, we're here. Radio City Music Brawl, you sign in, and then you go to your, choose your assistant screen. You choose what, this is Christina or Vincent, I mean all the different assistants in the game have different attributes. And, okay. and then first you choose your band, oh, which band do I want to choose? Go choose this band, go choose this band. Oh, this is the band, okay, I'm going to go with them. Okay, here, oh, check this out, oh, this is the map, we're going to look at all the opportunities, where are they going? Oh, we got to start the beginning, go to the house party.
choices. Thank you. Just know the deal. <laughs> No, So hello, uh, my name is Jerry, uh, and uh, the game I have here is called Intergalactic Bank. Okay, it's a uh, space theme. Uh, kind of, it's meets. It's a combination of it's a Clash of Clans meets Sinistar. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's an old Williams electronic game from back in the '80s. And I'll explain why that's important. Uh, you know, the the uh, uh, popularity of Star Wars, Star Trek, Eve Online, and it has a online personal personalization component. Okay. So uh, financial literacy uh, lessons to be learned are resource management, accumulation, and protection of wealth, and instant versus deferred gratification. So we're all familiar with Star Wars, Star Trek, Clash of Clans, kind of resource management, uh, Candy Crush Saga, what I take from that is the, uh, the map structure to it and how it encourages uh, players to keep playing, you know, how, how that game really took a quantum leap from Bejeweled in terms of getting the people to play uh, continually and really get up. Uh, Sinistar Williams, it was a really neat arcade game and it had a, uh, the, the mining aspect of it. And in this game, you are, uh, your ship, you're mining uh, resources. And by shooting asteroids, you get uh, uh, food, uh, fuel, and then power, and, as well as things that can be used for defense. Okay? And EVE, Eve Online, um, I'm really not that familiar with it, but I know you can you, know, you can spend a lot of money to customize things. And this game isn't really a rap about monetizing it, you know, especially for young kids. But it's the customization aspect of it. So uh, genre again: resource management, strategy, space combat. Okay, it's for iOS and Android, smartphones and tablets. Demographic: 13 and older. Mostly space themes skew towards boys, but maybe the personalization will, will uh, bring in girls too. Uh, it's single player with a potential for a multiplayer. So you are the captain of a spaceship. You mine for resources like in Sinistar. You attack and defend your wealth and resources like Clash of Clans. You show your game progress like Candy Crush Saga and you customize your ship. What this game introduces is a saving concept. So one of the resources that you mine for is gold. And rather than always spending it, you can send it to the intergalactic bank where it actually replicates and increases in value. And why that's important is that you don't always have to send it to the, to the bank because you may need it in the short term to make your ship more uh, stronger for offense and defense. Um, but if you send it to the intergalactic bank, it helps you uh, further down the road uh, because it increases in value. Plus, there's also a component where uh, you can customize a ship just based on the, the amount of gold that you have in the bank. So and it doesn't, it's no charge to the player, but it allows you to create a, uh, a spaceship just for collection's sake. So it has this kind of collectible aspect to it too. So it's something that kids like to uh, collect things sh they can share with their friends. And this is kind of the, the viral component of the game. So uh, again, you're mining for resources. Uh, and so some of these resources are gold, uh, energy, 
for uh, crew, for your crew and fuel for the ship. And energy is important because not only is it just uh, for fuel, but uh, your crew, uh, if they have more energy, their mental uh, sharpness is better, and it will help them uh, when you are actually not playing the game. Okay. Um, and it helps you in a defensive way. Uh, so when you're away, uh, how, when enemies attack you, you'll be uh, stronger. Okay. So again, you level up by defeating all these, element, these enemies in a sector in order to advance to the next sector. Um, again, you, convert, you can convert resource to gold to strengthen your ship and save gold by sending it to the intergalactic bank. Um, okay. You have, in a single player game, you, you clear the sector by uh, killing all the uh, enemies in order to move on. Uh, you can develop clans and leagues. Uh, let's see. Uh, teams will play because it combines the Allura Star Wars space, uh, space games. Uh, it combines action, exploration, and customization. And they'll learn about research, management, accumulation of wealth, and savings in the intergalactic bank. Time's up. Okay. Okay, structure of economic opportunity. Yeah. Do you paper prototype? Come on up. Do you have any? Uh, yeah, you. Do you have any slides? What was the team name? Yeah, the slide That's is you. the Excel spreadsheet that you guys gave for scoring. Come on up. Come on up. What was the name of the team? That's you. I don't have the name of the team in front of me. The name of the team is my only asset, and I'm playing the game now. Gordon, what's the name of the team? The structure of economic opportunity and the prospect of a new gold rush. A new gold rush. Thank you. That's me. So yeah, it's just the Excel, it's the Excel sheet that you guys had. It wasn't the uh, actual Excel, it's whatever uh, spreadsheet you guys got. So I'm going to pass out, while they're getting it up there, pass out the uh, collateral, no, which is... No, it's not from us, it's yours. I said it was your Excel sheet, which is your scorecard. Oh, that's your scorecard. Yeah. Do you have them? Uh, yeah. Um, just make sure that you pointed them in the direction of people who haven't seen that particular one yet. There are three items. They're all folded over three times. So you know there are team assets and pass them along. When you've seen all three things that have a, a triple fold, you've seen all of them. I'll do that in the meantime. Cool. Yeah. I wasn't aware of costume because I really appreciate the fact that people are playing the game uh, and telling us the rules and, and, and like living the dream at the same time because this is my fucking dream. I've been preparing my entire life for this. And I'm, I'm just waiting for them to uh, get that up. I guess uh, when does my five minutes start? Sorry. When did it start? How many seconds ago? Thank you. This is the question. Yep, it is. That's one. So uh, there are three assets there that you will see, depending upon, so our, uh, I will go at these in random order, and I've left my glasses, which is fine. So I'm going to go on uh, uncorrected vision, uh, which is, I think, an important thing to do because nobody's pointing uh, a, a finger at uh, the uh, naked emperor in the room, which I'd be happy to do after the fact. Everybody here, I assume, is not naive, knows uh, the valuation uh, associated, I mean, if your career is to gain people or in startups, knows the valuation associated with each of their hours on the market and how much they bill for them if they've ever done contracting and otherwise are probably studying to figure out what that is right now. That's what I'm doing or would be doing if I weren't up here telling you that my background is what I would invest in if I were a VC here. And there's nothing to say, based on what I read, that any of you, I mean, I, I would be surprised if there weren't at least four accredited investors here. Please make a vowel sound if you know the term accredited investor and any sound you feel like if you think you might. <laughs> One person knows accredited investor, two people think they might. No sound? Okay, two oohs, and ooh and ah, and, and two, so that's weird. That's fucking bizarre. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to school you. So I came up here for, via the CEO career track path, I guess, more or less. Uh, not that background, but I wanted to learn what the rules of the game were. And the rules of the game were you get on Inc. Magazine back before the internet boom when I was fucking young. Uh, if 
you found out how to be a cool CEO who knew how to put things together. Knowing how to put things together had something to do with learning what laws were, because laws ostensibly were how the system, capital S, worked. My parents, my dad, uh, was the sole support of his mom who had polio, and dad came to him asking me to borrow money all the time since his nine, and this is my dad, I don't know if I believe him anymore, but he told me since his nine-year-old uh, start having to support the family with a paper, uh, uh, paper route. Uh, and he became a PhD psychologist, happy to be painting now four days a week and seeing clients one and a half days a week for an average of $175 an hour. I uh, dropped out of high school, got into UMass Amherst, got uh, the lowest high school, the lowest college grades in the history of the uh, elite brown equivalent uh, version of the Ivy League uh, Imperial now currently uh, educational minister's stipend for a, a year in Japan, overstayed my visa, made the official cool. I get to find out what it's like to have a, a different structure of society where they ask you to write an apology if you make a mistake, wrote an apology, asked not to come back to Japan for one year because you're pink, you got some privilege, and you did at least apologize. Went back, made a career in Japan, found myself without any degrees making $70,000 a year based on an average of three days a week of work as a Japanese translator. I tra translate Japanese patents. That brought me into patent litigation interpretation. I do executive interpretation for IP litigation. And that led me to learning about valuations. Two or three years ago, I realized I wasn't born into a family where, like those families who, I would have started my, uh, my thing, but I'll just start it now, because I have a gut feeling about one of my things. So uh, I went into IP litigation. IP litigation gives you a, a feeling for uh, what a lawyer gets asked, and they will market the fuck out of themselves to get asked, would answer with respect to the following question. We don't know what the answer is to what is the rule here. One minute left. Thank you. For, perfect. We don't know what the answer is to what is the rule here. Pass these out. These are the character classes. See me after. I'm not pitching for the 15,000. I'm pitching to, for one of the three, the three places because it would be interesting to have us invest enough time to get to the other end. The game that I am playing right now is finding out how you get from the path of what I am playing here, which is I am the avatar that you will be able to play with all the legal knowledge of whether or not we have any rights to our assets that we have given away for free without signing any license agreements, so far as I know. We are paying all licenses to all assets that we've shown you and any derivatives until we talk and shake hands or do something else that connotes something like a contract. And when you know the rules, as you will find, as you learn more and more of the rules, you can game the system. I think that's enough. My artist architect friend over there and I argued and had so much fun. We designed the thing as a text game that is its own programming language. And I am a programming language teacher. And she's okay, the artist. Thank you very teacher. much.
parents love you, but it's time to go start your own life. And so what I've had, uh, what we have is we're pretty much trying to build wealth and we're trying to build happiness as well as trying to build our uh, overall legacy um, as well as master something, some career. So for example, this player chose he wants to be a talent agent or a movie agent. And what I've done is, if you connect to Facebook, you can actually pull interest to be able to take, like, popular culture, for example, uh, this is Tobias, and he wants to get an acting role, so he approaches the player to say, hmm, okay, uh, can I get a contract from you? I'd like to act for you and serve you in anything. So yes, uh, you can say, okay, well, give me 500 a month, or the player can say, hmm, maybe I want to take 20% of your roles, like 20% of your actual, uh, you know, money that you get from a movie. And so you can say no or yes or whatever or go to the next job. But what you want to do is that you want to master something. And that will build your wealth. It, will build, it could build your happiness. It could kill your happiness. Maybe you can take a job that's at uh, something you don't like doing. and something your character doesn't like doing. That will detract your happiness. Now eventually, this is just our short single player game. It takes about three to five minutes to actually play this. To actually go to the next game, your goal will to be to be debt free by the time you retire, and also have offspring. So all the events would actually take place up here. Anything that happens, any new opportunities that come along the player's way will happen up there. And to actually get to the generation part, you have to have a kid. And if once you retire, you have to, this kid has to be out of high school, debt free, and then you can start your next generation. And all the meanwhile, you're building your original legacy for that player that you chose at the beginning. So you can go back once you finish the first game, and you start a generation two, or generation one, generation two, and so on. And I've also, I like the idea that in Puzzle and Dragons, and you know, we all played Pokemon as a kid. There's something that's collectible, like you collect things, you get rare things. So I want to introduce power-ups to the game. And if you get a power-up, you also, there's a rarity for that power-up. You get power-ups by completing certain masteries of jobs, completing different job types, doing events, doing, I don't know, giving Tobias a movie role. With these cards, you can actually get pets or just collectibles that you add to your profile. So you're appealing to the casual gamer by having it about three to five minutes long. You're also appealing to a hardcore gamer who's going to really put time into that game to collect all the cards, collect sets, get bonuses from collecting all the sets. All in all, I really want someone, really want a player to learn how to handle their debt. Because oh, one thing I didn't really mention, uh, say you're starting, you just start the game, you're starting off, and you have to go to college. You can pick Stanford or Berkeley, but that's way too expensive, so you have to go to community college to start off. If you don't have the money, you take out a loan, and that's going to add to your debt. Pretty much, this is just going to give you give the player a way, very simply, to figure out that you know what crap debt actually builds up, and it kind of kicks you in the butt if you don't worry about it. So that's my game. I hope you guys enjoy it. So the next company up, Oil Inc. Now, while we're setting them up. Um, if you have already sent your one-pagers to Gordon, great. If you happen to have paper copies and you've already presented and, no, and you never emailed them to Gordon, please give us your paper copies now. Just come towards Gordon and give him your paper copies, and we'll pass them on to Joe. The writing piece, yeah. You have this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I remember saying Oh, and uh, two minutes bio.
Hello, my name is Andre. I'm here with Matt to uh, talk about Oil Inc. Oil Inc. is a competitive oil industry simulator where a player can engage in all aspects of drilling, refining, transporting, selling oil, all at real market uh, world prices. After, initially, after um, the initial bank loan, the, the player can choose one of the career paths or engage in all three by his choice. Um, the goal of the game is to make a successful oil business, balancing growth, debt management, profits, expenses, everything without going bankrupt and having the bank seize your assets. So I'll walk through every part of, uh, part of the gameplay with you briefly. The user is going to see three choices and each of them are going to describe exactly what each career choice means as a whole to the whole gameplay. The first aspect is production. After choosing your headquarters, the player will be able to go into the bank, take a loan, and with the loan and a set interest rate, he's going to be able to build his oil empire. The interest rate for a beginner player is going to be, there's going to be no, no fees and no, no interest for the first week. After the first week, he's going to have to start paying back the interest and the loan itself. If he doesn't do that, interest grows. And if, if that doesn't, if he still doesn't pay it, the bank starts seizing his assets. So in a way, he, he has to plan his 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 building and his contract in such a way that he makes money within the first seven days of the game. It's pretty easy to set up. It takes five minutes to um, go on, kind of 
inspect the market, see what other people are doing, uh, see what other people are selling the barrels of oil, see kind of what competition is like. You have sellers and buyers. You can execute sell orders for certain barrels of oil. You can execute buy orders if the sell orders you feel are too high. Um, you select a piece of land. You can either survey it or buy it. By serving the piece of land, there's oil, and there's always a limited resource of oil on each piece of land. The actual land value grows. Once you buy the piece of land, you can build oil wells and start drilling for oil. Now, the point of the game is to balance all three aspects of production, logistics, and brokerage through collecting and shipping the oil all the way from the producer to the seller. So in this aspect, we have kind of the progress bars of how, how the, the first part of the game collects everything. Once something completes, it goes back to the refinery. The refinery processes the oil. Once that's done, it goes to, to another player or to the same player if he chooses to engage in that aspect of gameplay as well. He refines the oil, he transports it and gets it to, to, the, to the broker who, through building his franchises, gets spotted market prices of real gas prices that are out there right now in the world, from New York City to Chicago to other places. So in a way, everything's randomized. Every time he builds, um, he builds a franchise, he gets a price from the United States, but he does not know which price that is. So in essence, he's trying to collect a portfolio of, of franchises that give him the best price for oil. So in that sense, when he's getting the oil from the producer, he can sell this for profit, and all three people make, uh, make a profitable uh, uh, income. And the other aspect, which is the multiplayer aspect, I'm gonna have Matt talk about, which is the syndicate or the corporate aspect where you have members joined together, each of them specializing in one aspect of production or logistics, or brokerage, and, and engage in, in map domination. Okay, so one of our uh, most interesting uh, concepts that came up with is our syndicate system, where multiple players can come together and basically form these syndicates. And what happens is, most of the time, they should it helps them out because they basically cut their costs down working together. And by doing so, like it just makes everything run very efficiently. They can go, and plus, when they're together, they obviously have more access to capital, which lets them grow much, much faster. But of course, with more capital comes an incredible amount of risk. You can take out a huge loan, but you know, disaster, or if you have certain players that start to become kind of toxic assets within the corporation, then obviously things start to fall apart very quickly for you too. So there's a huge amount of management and decision making within like these different. Uh, so yeah, what we try to do is basically, you know, everyone performs these syndicates where you're playing almost a game of StarCraft where you're trying to control land and territory and trying to beat out everyone because the market share is only so big. So you want to capture as much of the market share before everyone else is and that's basically the goal, ultimate goal of this game. So before we even started trying to design this game, the first thing we did is we tried to find what is it, what are the type of apps that teenagers use? Their Instagram, Snapchat, and um, of course, um, uh, WhatsApp. And what they all have in common is that they're all driven by social user-generated content. And since music is also social, and it's also generally user-generated content, we felt that it would be great to mix these two dynamics together into a really fun game. 
So the first thing the player sees when they download the app is, is the screen here, where you can assemble the music the same way you would assemble uh, add a, a, like a filter on top of an Instagram photo. You can drag and drop uh, items onto this screen right here, and you can create music very simply. So uh, Mark, why don't we go ahead and, and drop a beat? So here we go, we went ahead and dropped the beat. And then what we can do now is we can also just increase the tempo by, uh, by moving the slider here. So we increase the tempo, move, bring it in the slider here, and then let's, go, let's add a hi-hat. So now all of a sudden we're creating music just as easily as it was for you to create a photo, a really cool photo on Instagram. And by creating this in, in, in a timely fashion, so if you're making the right beats at the right time, you start to get awarded. So you get awesome, uh, like you can get eight fans just by adding this, uh, adding this to, uh, uh, to, to the music. In addition, this is all super social. It's the same concept as you would see on Vine, you would see in any of these types of products. You, you can actually share within the network where you're, creating a, where you're creating a community where people like your stuff, they follow you. In addition, you can also share it to all the major social networks. Now what we call here, this is called a gig. This is your DJ gig. Now when you go ahead and finish your gig, the first time you meet this guy named, uh, named Mobile. So Mobile is kind of like the guy that, that's, that's like your mentor. He's, he's the one that's teaching you the ropes. And the way he's teaching you the ropes is by putting you in difficult situations. So he's always asking you to make difficult choices. So in this case, we just finished, we got $40, and he gives you a choice. Do you want to go ahead and buy some clothes? Or do you want to put gas in your car to get to the next show where you can make $80. Um, by putting on uh, new clothes, well, you, you're going to have more bling, so maybe people will actually, like, if you, maybe you become a more popular DJ. Or, you know, you go out and go uh, play this. So if, uh, if you choose um, the, the first option, which is, which is the bling, uh, what, what he will do, he's, he will instruct you in a gentle way that, hey, this might not be the right way. And the way he's going to do that is by using a real celebrity in, that potentially went bankrupt and tell you exactly why they went bankrupt and why that choice might not be the right choice. Now if you want to go ahead and make the right decision, he automatically rewards you, maybe gives you a little bit of a blink, just so he can say, hey, you know, you, you, you got the right choice. Now this gets really interesting as you move forward because he gets to put you in more and more difficult situations. So say for like a, a, an advanced player, he may get a choice like, hey, you get a chance to open up for Daft Punk over in London. And that could potentially make your career. But it's going to cost you a ton of money to go there. And it could potentially, you can get to the point where you can actually lose all your money. The other choice is you could play here at Ruby Sky, where you can actually make more money and you don't have to travel, but you might not be able to make your career. So what is the actual choice? Here? What, what is it that, that, what's the right choice? So you, he's always putting you in the right situation uh, or making you choose what the right situation is. As a general rule of thumb, the fastest way to progress through this game is by living within your means. If you're living within your means, you're able to accumulate wealth faster, or whatever your goals may be, be able to, whether it's improving your turntables, tables, adding more beats, whatever the case may be, and that's how you were able to, you know, uh, go through the game at, at, at the fastest, at fastest pace. So, that's us, this is DJ Thrifty, we're Instagram for Music. So Meat Saber, come on up. You, Meat Saber is the last team I have. Have I missed anyone? No? Okay. I expect you to make some uh, cuddling with the tumor today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> missing. We just can't do that for Are there remote participants that are like uh, submitting via the internet? There's one. Can you? Can you? Just a game. 
and uh, you don't know how to apply it to your real life. So you win, you know, a bunch of gold in the game, but if that has no, you know, how do I bring that into my real life? Um, there's also, if we try to add a lesson onto it, and we realize it's a lesson, we usually shun that. We're like, oh my god, I don't want to be taught. And then, uh, and then there's also, you know, the, the fact that we just play and move on. And so, so it kind of, you know, keeps us moving. And it's kind of good that we don't, you know, move on, because I would, you know, be fighting pirates, I would be, you know, be running from cops, I'd be eating mushrooms trying to find, you know, a prince or a princess. <laughs> um, but what I really wanted to try to drive it down to is at that core. Uh, what is that core? The habits that we have. And so, um, so I always, you know, have been taught, you know, drill it down even further. So I want to do positive saving habits. So how do I, you know, get into the positive saving habits? Well, if you dig into habits, uh, habits are formed by repetition. So I want to form those through fun repetition, not just repetition. Repetition is boring. Uh, let's have some fun doing it. So the base model is you have a savings account. That's boring. Add a game later on top of that. Yeah, baby. Add that together, and then you'll have a fun repetition process for creating a habit of saving money. So enter the meat saver. So when you get into the meat saver, your first thing is that you log on or you create an account. We're a new user, we're gonna create an account. So the very first thing that we need to do is apply a goal. So what is what are we after? Are we after that new MacBook Pro? Are we after a vacation? Are we after you know an iPhone? We put in the, the dollar amount. The next step is we then create our meat. So we give our meat a name, choose you know the body, eyes, mouth. Uh, this is my little pooper. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, and then once we get into the game, this is uh, where, where you start having fun. So the, this right here is going to be your savings bar. This is your bar up to your goal. So that's reflective of your real life savings account. And you're trying to you know, reach that goal by putting money into this. Uh, these bars up here is how uh, little pooper's doing. Yeah, I missed you too, buddy. Uh, and then down here is where you're going to, you know, feed, train, buy, love, share, you know, fight, all that good stuff. So I'm seeing that he's a little bit hungry, so let's go ahead and buy him some food. And now it goes into the buy menu. This is where you can buy cougar little things. You know, do I need a med kit to, you know, help him get healthy? Do I need some food for him? Oh, obviously we need some food for him. All of this is going to be guilt-free purchases. So anything that you buy here is actually putting money into your savings account. So it's helping you reach that goal. And so let's go ahead and uh, just buy a cougar uh, hamburger there. Yeah, buddy, here's some food. So hit the feed button. Nom, 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 nom. He's hungry. And now he's a you know, full little baby. So let's uh, go ahead and train him. So the train is where it gets into a little bit more game. So the train kind of gets into like a Pokemon style game where you're going out, you're finding bad guys, and you're, you're uh, fighting them. Now, if you notice, your goal bar has now changed into your HP bar. So the better you're saving, the more energy you'll have to keep fighting guys. Uh, and then the, the goal of finding these guys is to, of course, win things. So you know you want to win those fancy glasses or that toothpick or a, a new outfit for them. Uh, it's also going to allow you to unlock abilities that you can then get into PvP with. And then if you die, of course, your HP bar will go all the way down, and you'll have to wait till that recharges. So he won that battle. So let's go ahead and uh, hit the fight button. And then this takes you to the map. So this is where you can see uh, other players that are around you. So, uh, so I want to find someone, I'll just click on that. Bam, Boogie wants to fight. I'll fight Boogie, bam, kill him, crit kick. So, uh, so doing good with that. One minute left. Okay, okay so, uh, so and then the uh, victories against uh, other players will have better chances of dropping items. Um, number of battles can be found on a leaderboard, so of course it's going to connect into your Facebook account so you can see how good you're doing. But if your meme is gone, so is your score. So that's important, I'll try to get to that later, hopefully I'm quick. So uh, let's hit the fun button. The fun button just allows you to you know, interact with your, you know, your little cougar there. Uh, now if you don't maintain your, uh, your bar there, your uh, meme's going to get mad, so you want to maintain that. If you don't maintain these, he, of course he's going to get sick and die. You don't want him to cry. He's going to annoy you, so he's going to shake your phone. He's going to you know, send you messages, all that kind of stuff. Now this goal meter, uh, as you fill it up here, this is going to allow you to upgrade your, uh, your meat. Uh, and if you take really good care of your meat, he might send you real world little gifts in the mail. So you might get a, you know, a little gift card in the mail saying, I guess you don't want to know. <laughs> all right, the three finalists are Radio City. Let's give him a hand.
uh, Super Scraper. Let's go ahead. So Steve is going to say a quick uh, sort of brief on why each of these three awards are worth so I've been told I can only say one sentence for each of these, which makes it very difficult. You know, it took us a little longer, uh, and we could have spent a lot more time back there, but um, first I want to say, you know, fantastic job to every team. Uh, you guys, you, you took the challenge that was laid out on Friday night, and you spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, uh, and a lot of creative creativity came out of that uh, over this weekend. We recognized that. And it was very hard to make a decision uh, to narrow it down to three. But at the very highest level, you know, the reason why we chose these, first off on Radio City, was really it was the fact that it was a themed platform you know, around music that we thought would really appeal well to the age group. And we love the fact around how you're developing the value of the asset uh, throughout the game. An entrepreneur, uh, you know, just right out the gate, the whole concept of you have 500 bucks, and then you know what can you do with it? You know to uh, you know create the uh, you know the best financial outcome. It was really around giving you money and using it wisely versus you know if you do well, then we'll give you the money and the rewards. So clear concept and super social. And then on super scraper, you know it's very clear, it's very straightforward to us. Uh, you know it was probably the one that really the most important financial skills uh, were clear you know in regards to what was required to win around managing the assets and the debt uh, and we also like the classroom competition aspect we thought that this would be the uh, easiest one to put into a classroom build around the curriculum and then have that level of competition um, and so that's the reason we chose the three but again thank you to everybody and you know i'm sure i trust will say some more uh, but congratulations to all of you guys who worked this weekend for some great stuff. Final words from Amtrust, Steve? Uh, my team had no idea. We have never done this before. We did it. We did it on a complete whim. We um, we just believed in the community, and I think I am just completely overwhelmed with what you guys have brought forward, uh, the competition, the energy, and I'm still honestly still processing the amount of energy and brilliance and enthusiasm you all brought. I think I can't thank you guys enough because it is so hard to wake up in the morning and be part of an insurance company, look in the mirror, <laughs> look in the mirror and say, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> and I think you guys brought that to life, that what I'm doing Are you saying we might actually meeting? matter. We you gave me meaning. You that's gave awesome. me meaning, you, you reinforced me. And, and that's the value. Yes. You came in as a as a company with a, you know, seeing a problem to yep. solve. I'm curious if through the process it gave you a different perspective on either the problem or even the potential solutions. Is there anything that kind of you became enlightened from this overall process that you hadn't anticipated or seen coming in? I would say that I, what I became enlightened with is that there is no single solution to this problem. And that there is not one single pitch I heard that didn't have elements of something in it that wouldn't make a difference. And, and that becomes the very challenge. And I think I got a note from, I don't know if anybody you saw a guy here, a tall guy, a friend of mine on Friday night. He sent me a note and he said, Steve, if you're trying to solve financial literacy, if that's the words you're using to these people, it's too big of a problem. You've got to start to break it down. And I think that's what you guys did. Each of you individually broke it down into your own world and your own language. And we were just discussing it broadly here, is that you know people are different. You can raise four kids in this family and they'll all respond differently. And so financial literacy is too broad of a term. And that's the thing I walk away from that you guys all taught me is that you all have different perspectives, you all have different solutions. They're all extremely valuable and valid.
Can, can I ask the one thing that yeah, you got out of it that we didn't? I got these. Everybody was so open. Like there was a corner office in use 20 minutes other than our 20 minutes, so far as I know, in terms of people keeping things secret. Yeah. And the, the ideas were amazing. So the one idea, there was an offsite team, I guess. What was their 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 uh, 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 team name and, and, and game? Planet. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Let's give answers again. Thank you. So you guys know Yeti Zen works with a lot of different sponsors, but I gotta say the experience of working with that team over there on that table has been one of the best ones. Hey, 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 hey. in terms of Design Jam, you guys who attended would agree with that. And so everyone who attended and pitched, thank you for all your hard work this weekend. Thank you judges for taking time out of your personal lives to come on here on a Sunday and spend a couple of hours with us. So let's give everyone a hand involved. And uh, Gordon and Mel, thank you. You can go to sleep now. <laughs> So, finalists, if you could go into that back room over there, and Amtristream uh, and Omar, if you guys could go in as well, so you guys can discuss the next steps. And everyone else, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you at the next Design Jam or event. Bye.